Hello, Living Word family. We are glad that you've joined us on YouTube. We want you to be a part of this message that touches your life every day. So on behalf of Pastor Pierre, my wife and I, we are glad that you engage. We want you to subscribe because there's so many messages on here that you could listen to on your leisure. We are glad that we're able to serve you. But we also want you to go to our website. When you go to our website, you will find a lot more information, even the sermon outlines. And also, you can provide an opportunity for you to see a list of our materials, books that you can look at that meets your need, and you could share with other family members or friends. We could also give. As you give to Living Word, you know us. When you go to our website and you do that, we use those funds to serve the agenda of God for the glory of God, and that allows us to serve you effectively. So we're glad you're here with us. Subscribe, be a part of this, and I pray you join us again and keep involved as God so leads you so that we grow through these times and are coming out of it better than we went in. Thanks for allowing us to serve you. Let us... Today is a... Uh, today is really a... Uh, Today is really a great day in this ministry, and I am so excited. I can't think straight, but we're going <laughs> we to look at this. We're going to continue our series, Pain to Promise, by going to Genesis chapter 50. So join me in Genesis chapter 50. I'm excited. I'm excited today to see our leaders. We're going to have a retreat coming up in a month. I'm excited for us to go on that retreat. We do need you to sign up, those who are going to be on that retreat. We don't need you to sign up. We thank many of you for showing up at 9.30 and not say it too early for you 11 o'clock folk. I'm glad y'all didn't think it's too early. At least we met y'all halfway. We did. So I'm glad to see some of the young folk out here. Y'all actually got up. <laughs> Who's talking? with all that gray hair on your head. In Genesis chapter 50, look at verse 15. He says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pay us back in full for all the wrong which, he did, he, which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of your servants of the Lord, of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then the brothers also came and fell down before him, and behold, we are your servants. And Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for I, for am I in God's place? Please heal, keep that in your mind. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive so therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So be comfort, comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Dear God, your word is truth and God, it has no error and you don't keep these things from your people. God, you could have done it and just give this wonderful, perfect picture of perfection every moment and every day of your life. But no, Lord, you show the good times and the broken times. You've taught us all of these things in your scriptures so that in the midst of Satan's activity and all that he does, we can find your way and heal, be strong, be better. It's in the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask you to let this passage be clear so that your people would understand your mind so that in the midst of painful situations, we come out better, not bitter. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. One of the things that life will bring is relationships having difficulties. That's just going to happen. Why? We are not perfect. We are not perfect. We have different things that we will struggle with. We all have different things that we would struggle with. 
And because of that, when we come into relationships, we bring those things with us. We just bring them with us. So sometimes because people have grown up in abusive relationships with fathers or mothers or brothers or sisters or, or all these different things that take place, then it's easy when they come to relationships to bring that with them. It's easy. Uh, it, it's, sometimes people saw families argue and fight and split up and not talk to each other for a year. So when they come to marriage, they argue, they fight, they go to their bedrooms and they don't talk for a long time. In some family structures, you would see where people would turn around and have situations where they keep grudges. They keep grudges. And, and when parents die, these grudges come up. She liked you more than she liked me anyway, so why don't you go ahead and take care of her? I ain't got nothing to do for her. She didn't like me like she liked you. These grudges come up even when parents are older now and people have to take care of them. The grudges come up. Sometimes in relationships, people have gone through a relationships with a man or a woman, prayerfully a man with a woman and a woman with a man. And they've gone through those relationships and those relationships ca cause so much pain that they struggle with trust. Trust becomes a big issue. So anytime somebody says, trust me, you would think that would fire them up to want to have a relationship with the person, but many times it puts up their defense mechanisms because they don't believe anything you should trust. Matter of fact, some people will grow up in relationships where they were told, don't trust nobody. And so guess what they grew up doing? Not trusting nobody. And what does that happen in a relationship? What's the first thing God said to do with him in a relationship? Trust me. So even having a relationship with God gets difficult. And as a result of that, when they're talking about trusting God, it's hard because they grew up not trusting anybody. So a lot of times when we come to our situations in our lives, our past even damages our relationship with God. And that's why when we come to relationships, if we don't come to it with a mindset of grace, we will stay broken. We will not come to a relationship where we could heal, we could get better, we get stronger, we get more productive because we did wholesome. No one comes to relationship wholesome. Most people come to relationship broken. And when they're not willing to deal with grace, it's hard to heal. And it's hard for God to heal them. Before we jump into this passage, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 6 to see not only does it make it hard for them to heal, it makes it hard for God to heal them. You see, unless God can heal you, Joseph couldn't heal strong enough to heal his brothers. God had to heal him first before it worked towards his brothers. In Genesis chapter 6, please never forget this passage of scripture. It dominates my life when it comes to my relationships with anybody in my, in my proximity. Please remember this. In verse 14 of chapter 6 of the book of Matthew, he says, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, the word transgression means for their purposefully doing things to you, purposefully doing it to you, not, not accidentally doing it, like somebody walking by you and stepping on your foot. Transgression means this person purposefully chose to hurt you. He says when a person, if you forgive others for their purpose actions to hurt you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. If you do not forgive others, then your father, what's the word transgression? Our switches to you. Then your father, talking about God, will not forgive your purpose actions against him. So if I don't, if, he, if I watch other people act and I don't forgive their purpose actions to me, when I purposely decide to disobey God, he is not going to forgive me of my actions that I did. So now I got a load of sin piled on me while I'm trying to deal with the sin coming to me. And that's why the Bible is saying relationships put grace on the fire. Relationships put grace on the fire and we have to learn this or we'll burn down. We will burn down with hate. We'll burn down with resentment. We will find ourselves in the last parts of our lives in lonely places. Why be we lonely? Because we so walked away from everybody, don't want to deal with anybody. Sometimes because of how we were raised, we treat children a certain way so they don't want to take care of us in our senior years. And you see some people sitting in senior centers with nobody coming to them because they did not exercise grace and the fire of burning relationships burned them down. 
So how do you not get burned down when relationships are burning you up? Here's the first thing. Please remember when people come to you, the, the best way for this to work is when people who have done wrong come towards you, but it doesn't always work that way. When they come towards you or you go towards them, the first thing that is talking is the conscience. It is actually not the spirit of God automatically. Because somebody can, when they hurt you, when they're broken, it may not be that they're growing spiritually and they move towards you. I mean, let me, let me break it down for a minute. Please understand, God made us to walk with him. That's what he made us, okay? But that's a spiritual thing. But because God knew we were going to sin, he made us with a conscience. So if we have no spiritual drive towards anything, the conscience would make us go, that was wrong. We may not have a verse, we may not have a passage, we've never heard a sermon, we just know something wrong up in here. Or I did somebody wrong. And I shouldn't have done that. That's the second level that God placed in a human being so that if they never have a spiritual connection with him, at least they have a conscience that don't make them hurt somebody. That's why when people can shoot and kill somebody and go eat dinner, they're in the place of an animal. They no longer, they've lost the conscience. They don't have a spiritual connection. So they're acting like an animal who could go chase a, a, a squirrel. As a, let's say a lion chase a squirrel, eat the squirrel, and look for another squirrel. It doesn't go, oh my God, did I just kill this little Bambi? You know, like somebody told me, I can't go shoot deer because they're Bambis. Okay, I said, God bless you. I guarantee if you get hungry enough, you would, you would get a machine gun. You would even try to get a rifle or with a sniper stuff. You, you just go, I hope I hit something. I, I, I guarantee you, if you're hungry enough, you shoot bambees. Okay? So stop talking about that. But they, they would look at this, and the lion would chase bambi, eat bambi, and go to another bambi, eat another bambi, and just keep doing it. It doesn't matter. Because the lion doesn't have a conscience. So they could just keep killing. So when a person loses a spiritual connection and they lose the conscience, they're an animal. The Bible gives us this conscience that even if we don't have a verse, you're finding Joseph's brothers responding because of the conscience. Nowhere in this Bible do you ever see his brothers crying. Not one time. Not one time do they come and say, oh, Joseph, we heard. Joseph is the one weeping because Joseph is the one connected spiritually. When you connect it spiritually, God will take you to another level where you're never going to be comfortable about what's wrong. And that's why sometimes the people that are spiritual are, want to fix the relationship, do something for the relationship, help the relationship, make it work. And the other person is going, well, there you go. God bless you. When that Christian thing you're trying to do, I don't care. Why? Because a person who's in a spiritual connection with God can't rest. A person who is not in a spiritual connection with God will have a conscience that they did wrong and may not want to talk to you or may avoid you or may come to you and try to be nice to you, but there's no spiritual connection, so there's no crying with you. So they don't help heal your pain. That's why Joseph led to God to heal his pain. Because they couldn't heal his pain. Only God could. So that's why in the first step of this passage of scripture, we hear conscience. We hear conscience. And when your conscience is pricking you, act. Because it will connect you back to God. But if you ignore your conscience, you're heading to an animal. Y'all don't get quiet like that. You scare me. I'm going to start putting on a bulletproof vest, y'all. Now, 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 now here, here, here is the key thing here you find in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 50. This is what he says. And when Joseph's brothers saw that the father was dead. The word saw means, oh, he dead, dead. Right, what does that mean? Not only is he dead, he hasn't resolved none of this. He hasn't resolved anything. Please don't forget. They sent a messenger to say, Daddy said when he dies, I'm commanding you, Joseph, to do this. What's up with that? You were alive for several years after all of this. Think about a minute. 
he had the same problem he was in with his sons, and he never fixed it. Let me give you an example. Let me get, watch, walk, walk through this history because families take things and they keep it going for years. So, so, so watch it carefully. Now, Jacob and Esau had a tough relationship. Why is that? Abraham never pulled Isaac and Ishmael together to fix what these two women ended up doing to these two sons. Never did it. Never did it. You know, it's like some people, because the man left them, will use the kid as a wedge. Okay, get real quiet there. They use the kid as a wedge. Oh, you, you, so you're going to leave me? Well, let me see if you're going to get this boy. You got this, boy this kid ain't going to never know you. That's the most damage you could ever do to a child's life. You are using your child as a wedge. You've just damaged the child. That is the most selfish thing I see some people do. And I go, how could you do that to the child? Okay, you broken. Don't share that brokenness. And that's exactly what you have. And it's continuing all the way to Joseph and his brothers. Continuing all the way there. You see, there was an issue with, with, <laughs> with when you look at it, with Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael had to be kicked out the camp. The only time they came back together is when Abraham died. When Abraham died, in order to bury him, Ishmael and Isaac came together to bury their daddy. And when they came back to bury their daddy, you never see them back together again. And today, Ishmael and his brother, descendants of Isaac, still fight. Never got resolved by daddy. You, you, you go to Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau, birthright fight, all this other stuff. You see the mother loving one kid more than loving the other. Daddy loving one kid more than the other. And what you have is two sons that don't get along. And when they finally have to deal with one another, it's because Esau decided to come and meet up his brother Jacob and have a conversation. When the conversation was done, boom, they went back to their corners. So now when you arrive... At Jacob, dealing with his sons, nothing. What we don't tend to realize that we do to families is, is that we tend to think that when we shove something up on the carpet, and everybody come back for the picnic, everybody come back for the barbecue, everybody had a wonderful time when we had a reunion, that everything is cool. It ain't cool because it was never resolved. The issues keep penetrating one relationship after the next relationship after the next relationship. And it just keeps going on and on and on because we choose to sweep it up under the carpet and to say, you know what? I was wrong. And as a parent, I'm going to pull everybody together and say, this is how this family is going to function. How can we fix it? There has to be a patriarch in a family that will work through the difficulties of the family or the family will keep projecting this and the kids would get it. And when the kids get it, they damage other kids and we don't have marriages that hold together because people are constantly carrying around the burdens and the problems that the parents never resolved. And so instead of there being grace, Fire burns the family down. And as soon as the patriarch dies, everybody goes to their corner. Don't come back together ever again. Because there was unresolved issues that no one talked about. It is not cool to do that. I always say this about relationships. It's better to walk into the fire. Trust God to not burn yourself down. And if nobody changes in that fire, at least Shadrach, Bishak, and Abednego came out. And God gets the glory. And God gets the glory. So they saw it. So now we got a problem on our hands and the patriarch is gone. The problem with this is that Joseph is in charge. He is running a country. Pharaoh has so trusted Joseph, he don't even blink about what Joseph is doing. Joseph is running a country, two years have gone by, three years have gone by, and this has never been resolved, and the brothers are going, wait a minute, what are we going to do? Joseph can kill us. Don't forget now, their structure. Their structure is, if Joseph decides to kill him, he doesn't have to go down to the, to the courthouse. He could just tell the soldiers, kill him, and Joseph keep going. That's all he could do, just kill him. That's the problem in authoritarian leadership. Y'all watch how you vote. The problem with authoritarian leadership is it doesn't need a constitution. It needs a person that people give too much authority to. 
So, so that's what you have here is, is this man, Joseph, he says, oh, we got a problem. Joseph is hold a grudge. Here's the next thing about a conscience. A conscience speaks lies. Let me say it again. A conscience that is not properly dealt with builds lies. What do I mean? Joseph has been serving these guys for three years. They were coming to, they were without Egypt, they were going to die. They were going to die. Without Egypt, they were dead. So Joseph brought them to Egypt and set them up in the most rich place of the country, Gossip. If you start studying Gossen, there's grass, there's places to feed your animals, there's all these different things. Joseph set them up, he'll make sure that food goes to their kids, he serve their kids. Three years, three years he's doing all of this stuff to them and nothing is being resolved. But because the stuff is unresolved, they start saying what Joseph is thinking when he ain't thinking it. Let me tell you about, let me tell you about unresolved issues that make people, let Satan come in and tell them lies. Okay? The problem with a person who's not growing in the midst of struggles, who's not developing in the midst of struggles, getting better in the midst of struggles because they're growing towards Christ, not towards the problem, is their conscience is determined by who they are, not what the situation is. They're accusing Joseph of who they are. Not you, Joseph, has demonstrated himself to be. Joseph has demonstrated himself to be in an act of forgiveness. He's demonstrated himself to be a person who's going to do what God asks him to do. He's demonstrated all those things. But because they haven't fixed themselves, they're accusing Joseph of who they are by making him what they're, he's not. I'll say it again. They're accusing Joseph of who they are by accusing him of what he's not. Now, many times people do that. I know what you're thinking. I know I did you wrong, so I know you want to get me back. I know you, and you're going, whoa, whoa, whoa. I ain't said nothing to you. And folks come up with a list of things, and then they start accusing you of this list of things. And you sit there going, did I have a conversation or something? What you're listening to is their conscience, not you. You're listening to this. So let's look at their conscience, because this stuff is unresolved. You can't take it personal because it's their conscience talking. What's their conscience having this conversation? He says this. He says, Joseph has got a grudge against us. And he's going to pay us back in full. How is Joseph paying? Joseph been paying them in full. They got food. They got a house. They got grass. They got water. They're taking care of them. What are they saying? He's going to pay us back in full. He got a shot at us now. Because guess what they did to him? Watch this carefully. The conscience, when it's not dealt with, lies to you. All the wrong which he, we did to him. See, it's their conscience. It's stirring them up. We did a lot of wrong to him. Okay? Folks, you got to understand this. You got to understand this. This is how desperate this situation was. Look at chapter 42. Look at chapter 42. I, I want you to, for a minute, think about your brother or your sister that you're close to and think about them putting you in a dry well. Let me tell you how horrible that death is. Not only do you die from dehydration, from thirst, you have bugs biting on you, waiting for a chance to eat you, and you're alone in there and you can't climb out. There's no way to climb out of here. I want you to see how hard their hearts were when they walked off. Let me read it to you. So that's why their conscience now is pricking them because the problem with doing somebody wrong is you can't go back and fix it. It's done. It's in time and space you can't fix it. This memory is permanent. Look at verse 21 of chapter 42. Then they said to one another, truly we are guilty concerning our brother because we saw the distress of his what? Soul. He was in pain emotionally when he pleaded with us. Yet we would not listen. That's why it's a transgression. We would not listen. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. 
This is their conscience talking. We, we, we were walking off. We were literally walking off. Reuben is saying, man, we can't do this. He's walking off. Reuben is the one that came back to see if he was still there. He said, hey, man, we can't do this. We can't do this. Joseph is hollering. Distress means he is screaming and crying. He's 16 years old. He is screaming and crying and begging because he knows he's doomed to die. How could you walk off from your brother like that? Soldiers today can't deal with the pain of knowing on the battlefield I left my friend bleed out. They can't, they can't deal with it. They go to drinking. These guys heard him emotionally bleeding out and walked off. Loud. That's why they're saying in chapter 50, we did him wrong. <laughs> we did him wrong. I want to make a point that wasn't supposed to make it till later. I'll make it now. The only reason these relationships can heal is because the conscience got pricked. When God doesn't prick a conscience of a person, but you are called to do your father's business, you got to stop letting how they act determine how you act. Our model on Calvary's cross is, I'm here because my daddy told me to be here. This man is cussing me out. I ain't did him nothing wrong, but he changes his mind. If you look when Christ gave up the ghost, it's not long after that man said, forgive me. And remember me in paradise. It is after that man said, he knew that that man would turn to him. He stayed on the cross long enough for him. He looks down from the cross and he said with people gambling over his stuff, mocking him. Don't forget the cross is not as high as we make it. They, they put it low enough so people could literally walk by and talk to you. And they're talking and mocking him and saying all kind of things to him. And he still sits there and goes, Father, forgive them. Still stands there, lays is on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Relationship with God worked because the relationship with God was more important before the relationship with the person was important. When we make the person why we act a certain way, we have switched God to become them or our own emotions than God to be God. You never dethrone God in your life. No matter what somebody does to you. Because that is your salvation. Before, when we come to this passage, you got to see what Joseph is constantly saying. Because of God. Because of God. Because of God. In other words, no matter what you do to me, I never let God be dethroned. You didn't get into my soul so much that I made myself a God. Or I made what you've done to me a God. I kept letting God be God. That's why they said Joseph is a type of Christ. Because he modeled what Christ would do on earth. Many times, the reason why relationships don't work is because we make this pain in our lives God or the people doing things to us God. And therefore they bring us down to become just like them. Don't do it. It's better to be on a cross and be healed than to be broken and need more healing than when you first started out. That's why he says, they sent a messenger. It's always good to have a mediator. It's always good, you know. I like it when couples say, we ain't solving this. Pastor Cannings, would you meet with us? I'm good. It's because this is how healing starts. Healing starts when somebody takes the initiative. Please hear me, folks. Healing starts when somebody takes the initiative. You would love it to be the person that wronged you. But it ain't always like that. Okay? Healing starts when somebody takes the initiative. Healing starts. Here's what you have. They sent this messenger in verse 16. In other words, this messenger was sent with these instructions. You don't keep going. You don't stop going until you keep, until you get to Joseph. Don't come back here saying you couldn't meet with Joseph. 
That's what it means in the Hebrew text, looking at the mode of the verse, of the word. Keep trying to get to Joseph. I mean, Joseph is like a prince. Keep trying to get to Joseph until you get to Joseph because you don't stop going to Joseph and don't come back here telling us you ain't got to Joseph. Okay? You always need a mediator that is dedicated. Not always. Sometimes it just takes your initiative. But a, a dedicated mediator helps. But somebody to take the initiative or healing don't take place. Somebody does. In a marriage, same thing. You know, we don't get along. We just don't seem to communicate well. Or we just don't solve problems well. I am still sick of your mother. She drives me crazy still. Your family drives me crazy. Your brothers drive me crazy. Your sister drives me crazy. Your cousins drive me crazy. Your baby children drive me crazy. But here's the key thing. But at the end of the day, God ain't driving me crazy. God is driving me to heal. I, I, I'm a little bit ahead of myself, but I'll I go through it. However, the spirit of God wants. This is the dominant thing you must remember. The Bible says to love the Lord all your heart, your soul, and your mind, to love your neighbor as yourself. So anytime I can't love my neighbor, what God is saying is I don't love him. I'm going to say it again. Anytime I go to work and I can't, I can't stand this person, I'm, the Bible says, you don't love me. If I go home and this person's not acting the way I want him to, and I'm going to treat them based on how I feel because I'm now the God of the situation. The Bible says, hey, me. It says, you don't know what wrong they did me. Do you remember how much wrong you did me? Your thoughts. I know the stuff you be thinking. I know where your eyes went. That ain't nobody saw. I know everything. I know the cuss words you said quietly inside of yourself when you smile at the person like everything is good. But you were cussing them out on the inside. I heard all the cuss words. He said, I heard it. And you have yet to ask for forgiveness. But you asked me to bless your food. You ask me to keep you while you're driving. You ask me to bless what you're doing. While you did things that were wrong, and I still walked with you. How dare you come to me and tell me about their issues, and you don't want to obey me to you. But I'm obeying my Father in heaven for you. But you can't obey me for to them. So your sins pile up on you. So remember, if I can't love somebody, the person that I can't love is God. If you walk in the light as he's in the light, you'll have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from all sin. So watch this carefully. They sent this mediator. This mediator comes and the mediator, watch his face. Watch, watch, you got to watch these words. Watch, watch his words. He says, they sent a messenger, a message to Joseph saying, I say messengers because they said they spoke to him in verse 17, the bottom part of verse 17. So it had to be messengers. So it, look at what they said. Your father charged before you died, before he died. Whose father? Your daddy. <laughs> in other words, you, you, you see, they ain't fully got over their resentment. Why? They knew that their father loved Joseph closely. So they didn't get over the resentment of that. So they're trying to solve an issue, but they're showing that we still don't like the fact that he liked you more than me. That's one of the things I admire my mom about. I admire my mom about a lot of things. But we all know in our family that my mother loved her John. She loved her John. As a matter of fact, when she was passing away, we said, now let John go in there. But my mother never, with eight kids, made us feel different. I don't know how she did that. But we all know she loved her son, John. He walked in the house, hey, John. The voice changed. We say, oh, wow, this is like <laughs> not good. Okay? So everybody in our family would say, come on, John. Really, man? Really, man? 
You're going to sit up here and talk about mama's love like it's all, like she didn't love you more. We all knew it. But my mom would make a point to make sure she loved all of us. But we always know that. So some people in their families have a niche for somebody, but I don't mean they need to love the person more than they love everybody else because it leaves a mark on the kids' lives. It marks them. That's why this, this is the kind of thing that I fought in my, in my, in my family. You know, my kids would tell you, I did all kinds of stuff. No, I don't love the water one more. I'd fight it. I would just say you're different because it leaves a pain in their lives. So even though they're trying to fix something, they're going, your daddy. Your daddy said it. Your daddy that we kept away from you for 12 years that is in pain because of what we did. Remember your daddy that you cried over and wept over when he came to Egypt, you just scream, I cried. I mean, you look at when Joseph met with his daddy. You see the passage of scripture. He just hollered and cried and wept over his dad. And you see that in chapter 46, Joseph prepared his chariot, went to Gossen. He was the one rushing to Gossen to meet who? His brothers and sisters? His brothers? No. He went to meet his daddy. As soon as he appeared before him, he fell on his neck and wept on his neck for a long time. They saw all of that and they said, your daddy. So even though they're coming to fix it, that mark is still there. Please understand, folks, what you do to kids leaves a mark. Leaves a mark. Watch this carefully. He says, I just want to pick this a side item here. So he said, hey, your daddy said this, that you shall say to Joseph, this is a command in the, in the mode of the text, it's a command. Please forgive, I beg you. The daddy spoke to the boys, not to Joseph. Please, I beg you. I'm treating you as the prince, Joseph. I need you, the word forgive means, I need you to not hold what they did against them and demand payment for it. That's what the word forgive means. You owe a debt. Christ died on Calvary's cross to pay the debt, so I don't owe God nothing. That's what the word forgive means. You remember the guy that had uh, a rich person, and a rich guy, and the guy asked him to forgive him of his debt? But then he went to the other guy and, and fostered him, lock him in jail. Remember that story? Because forgiveness is about a debt owed. That's what it means. That's why the person would look at you and say, your car note is forgiven if they don't, like your, your school, note, school loan is forgiven. It means you don't owe a debt. So the father is saying, Joseph, don't demand a debt be paid by your brothers to you. Don't demand it. I am pleading with you, giving you respect as prince, to not do that because they could never fix it. Here's the thing about forgiveness. Forgiveness means whatever happened in the past, the person can't fix it. They can't fix it. That's why it ends up becoming a grudge because they can't fix it. So what a grudge means whatever time the situation similar pops up, I know what you're going to do. We do that all the time. Okay? Oh, no, I ain't, I ain't putting myself back in that situation. I know what you're going to do. So guess what we're going to do? We ain't going to go there, girl. Even though you may not have anger and a deep emotion and, and try to cut the person in the back, the fact that we respond that way means we hold a grudge. And many times in marriage, it's like that. Oh, no, 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 no. No, we, we ain't doing that because you ain't getting me again. So even though we say we love the person, the Bible is saying, no, you don't, because when it comes down to the depth of love, forgiveness, you ain't there. Or somebody was unfaithful in a marriage, and every time the person stayed at the store too long, where you at? Well, I, let, let me check your phone. Where's the other phone that I don't know about? <laughs> Some folks say, let me get that burner phone. Hello. Got quiet up in here. So let me find that burner phone. Where is that? Folk be all up in the car seat, looking all over the place, going in closets, trying to find it. Because I know you're doing something. But the person says, I forgive you. That's why I let you back into marriage. But everything about the marriage says, I got a grudge. 
So they technically, because the person can't go back in time and fix the wrong, they did not forgive the debt, so they're unforgiving. <laughs> Got quiet up in here. Watch, this, watch, watch what happens if that happens. Joseph is going to be in pain. They're going to be in a pain. And what God wants to do for Israel is in pain. You transfer the pain. That's why some of our kids are still in pain. They can't get past the pain. Some people get married again, but they're still in pain. They're still in pain. You know how they're in pain? The new husband or the new wife gets the whole story. Faithful person. I never forget that. Faithful person doing what they're supposed to be doing. But because the other person was unfaithful, where you been? Why are you coming home late? Where you at? What are you talking about? I've never been unfaithful to you. But the other person, they brought that pain and transferred it to this person. We have a way because of how we made emotionally, we have to get rid of pain. Pain is like an exhaust pipe on a car. It, 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 you got all this stuff working in the car, but it's got to burn oil. And when it burns oil, it excretes the oil through the exhaust pipe. Pain is where we got all this stuff going on inside of us. And we have to burn the Holy Spirit in order to excrete this dark mess. We transfer pain when we don't deal with pain. Watch this carefully. You got to deal with pain. You can't sweep it up under the rug. It becomes a mountain that you can keep stumbling over. I would rather confront something than walk from it any day. I always say to myself, before there's peace, there's a war. And peace is not what I create. Peace is what the Spirit of God leads me to establish. That's peace. Peace is not a feeling. It's a person, the Holy Spirit. I beg you. We did you wrong. Who's talking this whole time? The word wrong there means evil. He says, now please forgive the transgression. They took it to another level. We purposely did this. Of the servants. Oh, now we're willing to serve you. Of God, your father. We don't have a connection, David. Joseph, and what did Joseph do? He wept. Joseph wept. What does this say? This is a huge point in this message today. What does it say? Joseph is still in pain, but he still needs to exercise grace. I got to slow down, slow down your road. Joseph is in pain. It never said Joseph cried. Now, all this time he's been weeping, 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 weeping because he saw his brothers. He wept, he wept, he wept. There's five, six times he wept, he wept, he wept. You would think by now, they're back. He's done all these things. He'll just cry. No, Joseph wept. In other words, Joseph is still in the same pain when he first saw them to the same pain when he's been serving them for three years. Same pain. We tend to think that pain goes away. The only thing that happens with pain is that God gives you strength to not let it control you, not let it direct you, not let it become your God, but pain is still there. It's just that God gives you strength because the wound is still the wound. It's still the, what the person did. You can't erase that. Everybody says forgiveness is forgetting. I said forgiveness ain't no forgetting. If forgiveness is forgetting, then God ain't God because God never, never forgets nothing. God just chose that in spite of the pain of Calvary's cross, I keep doing what my father said I must do to you despite the pain on Calvary's cross. That's forgiveness. Forgiveness, it doesn't mean that the pain isn't there. It means that I'm not going to let it be my God. It's not going to run my life. It's not going to direct my life. It's not going to control my life. Because what I'm going to focus on is what does God want me to do. So Joseph cries in pain. But the very next verse, Joseph says, let's do this. The reason why many of us stay to where pain becomes a God and we go to depression. And the pain stays there, depression. So much pain, new people come around us. We don't want to see them, talk to them, nothing. It's transferred. Praying goes to marriage. It goes to jobs. Why do these people make me so sick around here? <laughs> 
that's why in healing, I have to accept my pain. If you don't get to the point where you accept your pain and work past it, God can't heal you. Some of us sit here with a whole lot of grudges that we don't call grudges. They just did me wrong. That's a nice Christian way of saying, I hold a grudge. <laughs> and I wish I could get them. If, if shooting was like the wild, wild west, they'd be dead, dead, dead. You know, some people shoot somebody and some people empty 36 bullets. <laughs> They're not trying to kill the person anymore. They're just trying to get rid of the pain. And they can't stop pulling the trigger. <laughs> You're still moving? One more in the head. Boom. <laughs> Joseph had all the authority to do all of that. But look at the next verse in verse 18. In verse 18 he says, Then Joseph, then his brothers also came and fell down before him. And behold, we are your servants. Behold, we are are your servants. <laughs> now, when relationships are going to heal and the person decides to come towards us, that's the test for grace. That's the test. The test is when a person goes, I'm sorry. In some cultures, their head is down because they're giving you the authority to chop it off or to let them lift it. When a person's come like that, that's when you know who's your God. Because they're at your mercy. Now, here's a key thing. Here's a key thing. In any relationship, grace is necessary. But if you're going to still have a relationship, humility is required. I'll say it again. In every relationship, grace is required. Every relationship. Because nobody's perfect. And if you don't forgive, God's not going to forgive you. Period. But if you're going to rebuild the relationship, now we're at the stage of rebuilding it, not dealing with the past. We just transition to rebuilding it. When we choose to rebuild it, it requires humility on the person who did wrong. If a person can't show humility when they've done wrong, you still are required to give grace, but you're not going to have a relationship. And you have to accept that you will not have a relationship because you, a person that wants a relationship with you will come to you and go, I'm sorry. Like a drunk willing to stop being a drunk. I'm a drunk. Not that I drink too much. I'm a drunk. I did you wrong. When a person done that, now you can have a relationship. If a person doesn't do that, grace is still required, but no relationship will be established. If I'm going to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, what does he say? Confess your sins. Humble yourself. I'll work with you. Until then, I'll correct you, teach you, work with you. But I can't have a relationship with you. So watch this carefully. He says this. Then his brothers fell. Behold, we are your servants. We are your servants. We are your servants. Watch what Joseph did. This is how you rebuild a relationship. Listen to me, folks. When a person is finally willing to build a relationship with you. I, I, I say this with you. Many times people have been treated wrong in marriage and has led to separation. Or sometimes people have been unfaithful in marriage and has led to separation. I've always said, don't just jump back with the person. There has to be an attitude from them because you're not just bringing the person back in your house, you're bringing the person back in your life. And if you're going to bring the person back in your life, they have to be the ones who are allowing God to be in their life. Because until two people are walking in the light, there can't be no fellowship. Joseph would feed them, take care of them, watch over them, help them. But Joseph didn't seek a relationship. Joseph kept asking, are you honest men? Are you honest men? Are you honest men? You keep going through from the time Joseph met them. The question he keep asking them, are you honest men? Are you honest men? Not until now. They chose to be honest. So Joseph never sought a relationship with them until they chose to be honest. Until then, I'll feed you. I'll take care of you. I'll help your kids. I'll set you up in a house. I'll do this for you. 
because I forgive you. I'm not holding a debt towards you. But having a relationship with you, no. So you can't have a relationship with somebody until they accept I wronged you. So don't jump back. Oh, he said, he, he said he's good now. I can see. No, don't be doing that. You maybe end up with some diseases up in there. Don't be doing it. Oh, well, you know, yeah, he talks so nice now. You know, you know we, we get together now. We seem like we get along so much better. Yep, that's what a fish says when they saw bait on the line. You're going to become a fish fry. The, the, the Bible is saying, until you see a commitment to humility, a commitment to be willing to serve God in what you're dealing with, don't run up in there. You run into a wolf. You know, wolves like sheep clothing. They just can't keep it on. It gets hot. <laughs> Watch it carefully. And Joseph says this. And Joseph said, do not be afraid, for I am in God's what? I love that. I'm no longer in my pain. I'm no longer in what you did me. I'm no longer in what you said to me. What I'm into now is in God's place. And when I'm in God's place, what does God say? Vengeance belongs to who? I can't do nothing to you. The minute I come into God's place, God is so leading my life, he, he tells me what to do, so I can't do stuff to you unless he tells me. So right now, he's not telling me I could cut your head off. He's not telling me I could do wrong. He's not telling me nothing. All he's telling me to do is to take care of you because there is a greater nation that needs to come out of this and because that's his will for me to get in focus on this nation, I can't do nothing but love you. See, when you get in God's place, you're now deeply committed to his word. I know this makes people exposed to abuse. Passed it long enough to know that. I've seen people being in God's will, getting more abuse. But I always remind them, God will protect you. God will guard you. You know what? I was going to end right here, but you got to read this verse because I want you to see God will bless you. Go to 1 Peter real quick. We're out of time. 1 Peter. I want you to stick around on fellowship and I don't want you to use me as an excuse. Well, Pastor Kenneth preached loud today. No. Don't use me as an excuse. I want you to stick around. I want us to build a body that is a family around here and you can't build family without being intentional about it. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3, watch what he says to a person who does you wrong. I don't have time to read from verse 8, but I'm going to read from verse 13. It starts in verse 8 and doesn't finish till verse 18, but we can't do that. Look at verse 13. For who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? The harm means they can't destroy you. No, 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 no. They could come do things to you, but they could not destroy you. And you see that? They, they, they came after Joseph. He did good in jail. Potiphar's wife told, did wrong, good in jail. Daniel, good and became prince. They can hurt you, but they can destroy you. Watch this carefully. But if you should suffer for doing, for, for the sake of righteousness, I am in the place of God. You will be what? There you go. You're actually putting yourself in a place of blessing. By choosing to be in God's place, then if you chose to be in your place, you set yourself up to be harmed and destroyed. But if you're in God's place, he says, I chose to bless you, to watch over you, to keep you. They may do stuff to you, but they can't destroy you. They can't tear you down. They can't destroy you. They can't hurt you. They can't damage you because I am protecting you. And in the long run, I'll raise you to be prince because Joseph is better off. Joseph is in Egypt. Joseph is a prince. Joseph got a nice house. Joseph got a nice wife. Joseph is riding in a chariot. His brothers are begging for help. God says, what people mean for evil, I can turn it around for good for those who love me. They, he, he says, don't forget this. He says, for those who love me, those who keep my commandments, in spite of the pain, in spite of the lion's den, in spite of the whippings, in spite of all the gossip, in spite of all the slander, in spite of everything they do, I in the long run will bless you. Joseph has got a chariot. He's got a house. He's got a wife. He's walking around with soldiers next to him. He's got people blessing him, looking up to him. Pharaoh doing what he wants towards him. Why? Because Joseph, you kept the word. When Potiphar did you wrong, you kept the word. When 
when your brothers did you wrong. You kept the word when you were in jail. So Joseph, I establish you where nobody could tear you down. Because God will never violate his promises. Never. He covenanted. He will never violate his promises. That's why you could go from pain to promise. Because God will hold to his 7,000 promises. And he blessed those who keep his word. I don't know what you're going through today. But I know if you choose Jesus to go through it with, you'll be better. I don't know the pain you may go through today. But I know the person when you walk with him, the peace of God will surpass all understanding. And in spite of your pain, it will keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what the pain you may feel today. But the Bible says, if you wait upon the Lord, he shall renew your strength. You shall mount up like an eagle and soar. I don't know what pain you're going through today. I don't know what suffering you're going through today. But the Bible says in his word, it doesn't matter what you go through, the sufferings of this present time. Don't compare to the glory to be revealed. I'll bless you eternally because you never walk for me. You never turn your back on me. And because of that, I'll bless you eternally. The Bible says, I don't know what pain you're going through today, but when you walk with me and love me, the fruit of the Spirit is peace. It is joy. It is strength. It gives you power. Because at the end of the day, somebody may try to hurt you while I'm going to try to bless you. Somebody may try to mess up your mind, but I will give you wisdom. Somebody may try to hurt you, but do all kinds of things, but I'll let you put on the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, the helmet of salvation, the belt of truth. I will bless you so that when they're trying to hurt you, all they're doing is lifting you. They're not putting holes in your sails. They are the wind in your sails. You got to stop focusing on the pain and focus on the promise. Let us stand. We are excited that you have joined us and I pray this message touched your life. We pray that you enjoyed it. We pray that it impacted your heart and we hope that you would subscribe and continue to grow with all the messages that are here. You can find a sermon outline. So we're glad you enjoyed it. Look forward to you coming back so we grow together. Thank you for blessing us and for blessing your life by allowing us to serve you.